Hello, uh, next speaker is Aaron. Uh, I cannot read that you were, uh, Aaron Seigel. Okay, uh, he will speak about plasma active. So let's applause to Aaron. Hello, I know we're running a little behind schedule, so I will try and be quick so as not to run into your lunch too much. So I'm Aaron. Um, I work with the KDE project, um, but I also work with a lot of cross-project um, initiatives as well, freedesktop.org in the past, a lot of the middleware that Bastian mentioned um, from uh, UDEV, UPower, UDIS, Network Manager, etc., Pulse Audio, we also use. So there's a, um, that's basically what I do in the free software world. Um, I'm the primary architect behind Plasma, um, and previously I was on our board of directors for our global nonprofit, uh, KDEV. So, Plasma Active, and this is going to be interesting because I didn't know what other people were going to be talking about per se, and Bastion's talk, the first five minutes of it are very similar to mine. So, I can skip quickly. <laughs> so, recently, a research group did a project to look at how open various uh, consumer electronic projects were. They looked at Android, they looked at Qt, um, the a toolkit from previously Trolltech, now Nokia. Um, and they, they tried to measure it on four different ways. One, how much access did you have to it? In other words, did you have access to planning? Did you have access to source code repositories? The middle screen seems to like to go on and off. They also looked at how open was the development? Could you get involved with the development of this? They asked, well, what about derivatives? Can you take it? and make your own product with it in your own ideas, in your own image. And then, of course, give it to other people. And finally, community. Was it open to a community, or was it really closed down? Was it, you know, basically a separate silo where it was all very controlled, or was it very much one, um, a project that encouraged people, regardless of where they're from, to get involved? And they measured openness. Well, they didn't measure iOS. I did this one for them. They're 0% open. Um, and of course, I, I put this one in there because we have iOS is one of the two major uh, mobile operating systems today. The other one is, is Android. And they measured it to be 23% open, um, which, is, which is interesting, uh, given that it's released under an open source license. But as Bastian pointed out earlier, it's really a closed product. Um, you can't get involved with development or planning and whatnot. To give you an example or to compare it with something else that's very successful in this world, Linux, uh, it was 71% open according to their measurements. I love how they're like right down to the 1%. It is 73.48% open. Um, but yeah, so Linux is 71% open. And the thesis was that the more open a project is, the more successful it is. In fact, the top seven projects they looked at were all within 25, 30% of openness. The one outlier was Android, and they mapped its success really to the huge marketing and financial muscle that Google brings to it. For those of us in the open source and free software communities, this is a little distressing because we basically had these two options, 0% open or 23% open, which really wasn't all that great. We also like working on things and hacking on things and making cool stuff. So we decided that we were going to take our project, which is Plasma, and which we like to think of as being 100% open, which is probably a lie. It's probably 90 something percent open. I mean. 100% seems a little too perfect. But we wanted to bring what we'd been doing um, in the KDE project and bring it to consumer devices. And this is what birthed Plasma Active. Um, how many people have used a KDE desktop environment? Okay, cool. So these days we use something for this called Plasma. And this is uh, what, our, what a Plasma desktop may look like. Um, and we really viewed it as a device, or we've taken a view of computing as a device continuum, which I'll get to in a bit. So we have Plasma Desktop. We also have Plasma Netbook, which you can see here in the search and launch page, which allows you to, well, search for things and launch. You can look things up on, on uh, say, Wikipedia, for instance, and it's completely integrated here. 
Um, you can also run informational widgets. So there in the top right is a weather widget. And I wonder if they have one on here. They don't. But you can run widgets on the desktop. In fact, they're the exact same uh, applets. Um, so if you can run it on the desktop, you can run it on your netbook. And we recently, uh, about three and a half months ago, started working on Plasma Tablet, which looks, I'm actually planning a trip to Morocco here, um, which is the whole idea. Um, what's really interesting is that all three of these projects, whether it's desktop, netbook, or tablet, while the UI is customized for the form factor, and I'll be doing a live demo in a bit here to give you an idea of what the features are of Plasma Tablet, uh, we actually use almost all the same code behind the scenes for them, which means you can write something once, whether it's that weather applet, for instance, I'll show it in a bit on my tablet here, um, and you can carry it between different devices and different form factors. So what were our, our goals with Plasma in general, but more specifically Plasma Tablet? First was elegance. We wanted to create an amazing experience for the person who's going to use this device. We wanted them to create an emotional bond with it. It had to become something that really made their life better in some way. We also wanted to create an efficient development framework. And we've leveraged the Qt Quick, which is a QML. It's a JavaScript-y um, environment for developing really complex, really beautiful UIs, which I'll show in a bit. Um, and allows you to do it very quickly. In fact, it allows you to work with an interaction designer, a graphic designer, and a software developer in tandem, and they can all get involved as equals. And, and really the ultimate you know, concept is to create an object of desire, to be able to make something that people look at and go, I want to use that, and then a week after using it going, I can't imagine I ever lived without this. One of our other driving uh, philosophies is this, this concept of device spectrum. A laptop, a tablet, a smartphone, a TV, a set-top box, they are being used increasingly for the same things by people, and they kind of expect them to work together. If you ask just like normal, average human beings um, what they expect their smartphone to be able to do, or their tablet, or their laptop, they'll name basically the same kind of things. Well, I expect mapping, I expect to be able to follow my friends on Facebook, I expect to play games, these kinds of things. So with device spectrum, we want to achieve um, a situation where as much as possible we can write it once and deploy it everywhere. And of course, you're never going to reach as 100%. There are differences, right? You have a keyboard and mouse on laptop. You only have touch on the tablet, and the phone is small. But there's a, we can get very, very close to this. We also want to enable users to move seamlessly from one device to another. So if I'm reading something on my nice, big, gigantic screen on my desk, and then I realize my train is leaving in 10 minutes, I have to be at the train station, I want to be able to pick up my tablet, say, put that thing I'm doing on my tablet, and then leave. Right? Um, to a human being, this seems obvious and normal and natural. We already see it in Hollywood movies. I don't know if anybody saw Iron Man, but he actually was like dragging things, you know, motioning them between screens. I mean, this is what people expect computers to do. And as technologists, we have to give this to them, I think. Um, and we also be ready for tomorrow's trends, right? I mean, right now it's tablets are hot and everyone's like, wow, what can we do with them? And that's cool. Um, you know, it was smartphones and before that it was net, but, um, but who knows what's going to be in two or three years. So we wanted to stop designing for today's hardware only and allow something that was flexible enough and malleable enough that whatever happens tomorrow, we can quickly and rapidly reach that point. So one of the ways that we've uh, been able to do this, even with relatively few resources um, has been really a highly componentized approach. So I mentioned before that you know, you've got this one uh, widget, say weather or a game or whatnot, and you can run it on uh, the desktop, you can run it on a tablet, on a netbook, on a phone, without actually recompiling it. Um, in fact, you can ship the entire thing in one platform agnostic package even. This gives us a very high level of reuse of not just code but effort between the projects, and so allows us to be very nimble in targeting new kinds of devices or new user segments. It's very easy to remove or add or replace any given part of the overall system. So as someone who's trying to create a differentiated product, you can go, I love all this stuff, the boring stuff, right? Oh, good, they have networking working. Good, awesome. I don't want to touch that because that's hard work and boring. But I would like 
you know, the UI to focus on, you know, gaming or social or whatnot. And you can actually replace if essentially any component that you don't like, or you can add any component you would like. So this allows differentiation at low cost and without high degrees of incompatibility with other products that are based on the same uh, uh, platform. So really the goal is fast development, quality results. To me, this is one of the most important things though. We're striving to do all of this in an e open ecosystem. Um, WebOS, as Bastian um, already noted, is, is unfortunately, for all intents and purposes, dead now. Um, one of the things they failed to do was develop an ecosystem. This is why iOS and Android have done so well. They developed ecosystems of developer support around them. It, it was kind of funny when Migo um, or was, was MIMO at, at uh, Nokia, um, and they really tried to get people to write apps for it. And it was, I always thought it was kind of, I used to chuckle about it because we had more third party widgets written for Plasma Desktop than they had for the entire MIMO. Uh, repository that was available online, which I thought was fantastic because I mean, here's a company putting out phones and really, you know, beating the drums, but you, if you can't build an ecosystem, you're just not going to get the results. We've proven that as a community, deeply entrenched in the free software ethos and uh, um, uh, ecosystem that we can do this. So around Plasma Active, we have both a collaboration of companies and there's about seven of them right now in Europe who are all working together as a loose collaborative of entrepreneurial, positive thinking, uh, forward thinking companies. Um, but we also have a great an, uh, number of community contributors who are doing it because they love it, they're, because they're doing it as part of research at university or whatnot. All of our planning is done in the open and we actually do most of our meetings, we do some in person, which anyone is welcome to attend, but we also do uh, all the interim meetings online on IRC, we pre-announce them, people can show up, either just lurk and see or actually get involved. This means that you can actually direct by becoming involved where this is all going and what can be done with it. And of course, we use a true open source development model. We don't just release open source code, we do all of our development in the open, public repositories, public patch review, public interface design. And our goal is to create an open market around this. Someone asked about Migo earlier. Um, we have Migo packages. We have a Migo repository. We just uh, opened up our ARM Migo repository. Um, I haven't tested it myself yet, so I don't, I'm not going to vouch how great that repository is yet. But we have the Migo Intel one that's working pretty well. We also have uh, a SUSE repository, OpenSUSE. And we work on generic Linux. Some of the Ubuntu people, for instance, are working on Kubuntu Active. We're vendor neutral when it comes to hardware. We love Intel chips, we love ARM chips, we love, I mean, any, we love computers. Uh, we're also open for third party application development. Um, this has been something that we've really stressed from the beginning when we were just doing desktop stuff um, and continue today. And finally, there's no royalties, no gimmicks, no advertising that we're trying to sneak in there. This is really about creating great technology and seeing what kind of open and free ecosystem we can create um, around awesome products. So the end goal really is to create this, right? A bunch of people, two-dimensional people standing in a circle. No, um, a community, a bunch of people working together, right? Sharing technology and making amazing things with it. All right, there's, there's the, uh, the, the sales pitch, right? So let's look at the demo. Let's see if I can get this to uh, work for me reasonably well. Find somewhere to put this. It's gone black. Ooh. My my camera's gone out of control. <laughs> but I have more power. Okay. Um, yeah, we'll just go with the internal camera then. This will be awkward. Um, yeah. Let's see if I can turn it around and... Oh. 
excellent. Okay, let's see if I can. So here we have, um, again, it's a WeTab, how familiar. <laughs> I, I promise we did not get together before this and go, let's test it on WeTabs and let's talk about openness and let's like, no. It's just great mind kit, right? Or fools, one or the other. Okay, so here is, uh, let me move this out of the way completely. Ah, oh, thank you. There we go. go okay. <laughs> so here we have a um, tablet running uh, Plasma Active. Um, keep in mind that this is running like 95 plus percent of the same code we run on the tab on the desktop and on netbooks. So one of the uh, key features is that it's activity based. We didn't want to create another thing that was just an application bucket, right? You turn it on, you get like this row of icons that can you can launch Angry Birds. Yeah, that's cool. I love Angry Birds too, but. Sorry, but bloody hell, do we really have to have yet another row of icons? So this is activity-based, and we have a little flicker on the side where I can go through and I can see all the activities I have currently running. So I have one actually with all my notes about um, demoing Plasma Active here. Um, and so yeah, you can create any number of activities and switch between them really easily. So here's my, this is actually a real world example. This is not um, demo stuff. I'm actually planning to go to uh, Morocco soon here. Oh, you rock, okay. Cool. Actually, if I do this, that's good. Don't worry, I got it. Okay. <laughs> My human stand. Please give him a hand. This, this is commitment right there. That's awesome. Um, while you're working on it, it will actually record uh, information about what you're doing. Oh, it doesn't have any right now. Um, and there's a little tab on the side that will actually, so if you go to a website or you launch an app, you'll go, oh, you're probably interested in that. Or if I have any files that um, talk about uh, Morocco, it'll automatically link them and put it in the recommendations panel, allowing you to very easily add things to your activity. So, actually, when I hold it, it's easier for me to touch things. Thanks. <laughs> oh. This is a really awkward way to use this. Very awkward. Here, just got it. There we go. If I tilt it towards myself, I can suddenly touch things. So you can also add random things. Here we have oops, contacts, um, images, uh, documents, and widgets um, that you can add. I'll cancel that for now. As you can see, I've actually got the aforementioned weather widget right here. It's showing me the weather in Morocco, so I can see how hot it's going to be. It looks like about the same kind of uh, weather you guys have here. So. So this is the, one of the two concepts, or two of the concepts we have, activities, you can create new ones, um, and recommendations. The other thing you can do is you can, you have the peak uh, bar here where you can just drag it down a little bit and see what apps you're running currently. So I have the, the main shell and I have the web browser, which is a touch enabled browser um, based on WebKit stuff. Not GDK WebKit, but WebKit, because WebKit rocks. Um, and so we have the peak, and these are, of course, live uh, thumbnails. If you're playing a video or playing a game, it actually shows it happening in there as well. You pull it down a little bit further, and you have your actual application launcher. So here's our application bu um, uh, bucket. Hooray. So these are the, um, the essential concepts. Um, Behind, uh, so it's switched to my, because um, it saw that I went to my web browser, which is actually right now associated with my demo activity, and so it switched to my demo activity for me, which is pretty neat. Um, so these are the four basic concepts that we have right now in the contour shell. Thank you, I'll relieve you now. <laughs> You're all done. So is, uh, thanks, um, activities, recommendations, peak, and launch. Uh, this was the result of three and a half months of work by two developers, one interaction designer. We're right now in feature freeze. Where we've got two months of polish um, and fit and finish left on it. Uh, we'll be doing our first release of, the, of Plasma uh, Active Tablet uh, in October. Um, and yes, that's what we're working on. So, uh, <laughs> now I can see myself. Okay, so one of the things that we really wanted to do was not just recreate what, um, say, Apple's doing or what Android's doing, because that's boring and easy. We wanted to create something that was really 
fresh, new, and, and interesting, and hopefully not patented. Um, so with this, I can actually organize my life. I can, it adapts to me. This is very cool. Um, it also looks really nice. Oh, one other thing I should mention, virtually none of the UI that you saw there is native code. It's virtually 100% QML, which is this uh, JavaScript with some extensions that, that touch into Qt um, that allows you to very rapidly create very nice looking, very swish UIs. Uh, this allows us to do things like create a weather widget or a game or some sort of online service interaction um, in one package and then ship it for all kinds of devices. You can even customize within that one package the UI. So you can say if I'm on a tablet, change the UI a bit like this. If I'm on a phone, change the UI like that. So this is not all about us though. There's opportunities for you. Uh, we're looking to continue uh, to expand our project and our community. So we're looking for more enthusiastic developers to work on amazingly great apps. We're looking for driven designers to help us improve the core UI, which is what um, the UI that you saw there is called Contour. Um, we're also looking to add more entrepreneurial companies to create opportunities with. Just as we have been in Europe, I'd love to uh, start planting some flags here in Asia as well. And as Bastion is, we're also looking for hardware partners to uh, broaden our market reach. We think we have something that's compelling, that's shippable, that is more than just a future vision, but a reality today. So we're looking for other people to work with us um, to making this happen. So that's my presentation. I managed to shave off about almost 10 minutes. That's pretty good, because um, I'm hungry too now. Uh, so you can find us on IRC in pound active or hash active or hash plasma on freeno.net we've got a couple of email lists and we also have a public wiki i'm also here today tomorrow and a bit of next week so feel free to harass me and pelt me with questions are there any questions now oh. here yes here. Uh, so maybe my question is not pretty related to to your talk but i'm uh, I'm wondering, just uh, as we know, Nokia has dropped Migo and mm -hmm. and went to the evil uh, the dark side. So and and they purchased a uh, cute a uh, cute from Trotec. Mm -hmm. So what's your take on this? Just uh, uh, what's the future development sure. of the cute? Okay, so there, there's three separate answers I'll give to that that all cut, touch on three different aspects of it. First off, I think this underlines the reason why it is so important to, um, when you have an open source project where a lot of the copyright resides in one place, you need to have some way as a community to ensure its growth later on. And you can say, well, it's always open, it's open source, so you can always fork it, but that kind of sucks, right? Especially when it comes to if you ever need to relicense, et cetera. So one of the things that we did in the KDE community years ago was we, we created the Free Qt Foundation and we signed a contract with then Trolltech and we transitioned it to Nokia when they purchased Trolltech as part of that purchase that says that should they ever decide to close Qt or stop developing it, it automatically becomes licensed under a very permissive copyleft license BSD. So we get access to it. Um, directly that way. This gives us a lot of confidence that even if they make horrible decisions in the future, we're still covered, right? So that's number one. I think a lot of, there are other open source projects out there that are in similar situations that haven't done this. And for years I've like told people, you encourage people, please you know, get similar uh, agreements with the people who own your copyrights. Um, number two, uh, let's say that you know, things go completely horrible and horrific and, and uh, Nokia stops putting one cent into Qt in the future. Um, there are enough companies, and I've been talking with a number of them over the last year actually, there are enough companies that derive all or a large percentage of their profits from Qt that have the internal uh, staff that are willing and knowledgeable um, to take this on, that there's a community of companies that would be willing to step in and take their role over in a heartbeat. So I'm not concerned for the future development of Qt. Thankfully, it's already a fairly mature product. It still needs work in various places, and there's places we could take it. But there, is, um, uh, there remains a large number of engineers available to us um, from these kinds of companies. I wish I could name names, but you know, 
things like this tend to be quiet. Um, thirdly, I think it really underscores the fact that we cannot just simply lean back in our chairs and go, great, the giants are on our side. Um, remember when we were fighting the giants at Microsoft, or for those of you a little bit older, the giants at IBM, yeah, and it was like, oh, we were up against the giants. We were, you know, the David to their Goliath. Um, and now we've got the giants on our side, right? Nokia, Intel, Google, yeah. We have to realize that these companies, while amazing assets and often terrific partners, can make changes to their decisions, their, their, their path, right? And all of a sudden, we're all of a sudden on the other side again. And we're like, hey, wait a minute. Um, we need to build larger networks, both in the community as well as in business, that isn't so centered on these giants. So that when and if they do change directions that doesn't agree with where we want to go, we're not left stranded, right? We, they need to be part of our, uh, of our planning and our ecosystem and our community, but we, can't, we shouldn't rely on them exclusively. Finally, I'll give you some good news that there is still investment happening in both Q10 and MIGA within Nokia. So I think the death and demise of Migo may have been premature, but yes. But really good question, even if it wasn't completely related. Let me, I'll bring it related. Tablet, cool. Oh, maybe I'll uh, ask another question that's more related. So, <laughs> <laughs> so uh, I know just uh, maybe a month ago, you just had a desktop summit in Germany, right? Uh, in Germany. So, and and you talk about KDE 5.0 and Qt 5.0. So will Plasma Active become the main, um, maybe the programming interface or or user interface of uh, KDE 5.0, the main way to develop uh, right. application for KDE? So first off, there is no KDE 5.0. Um, we actually actively have tried to make a differentiation between our, our libraries, which we're calling frameworks in five, um, our workspaces, which is the plasma stuff, um, and our applications. And the reason for this is because our community got so big and so diverse, and we do so many different things that calling it all KDE was causing all kinds of confusion, both for us and for other people. So we're right now working on frameworks five which is our libraries and our runtime dependencies. Um, Plasma is already being worked on as well simultaneously, although we haven't announced that. Um, but then we'll work on applications later. So yes, this is a work in progress. So to answer your, your, your question, uh, Plasma will remain the primary uh, interface for desktop, netbook, tablet, etc. Um, we definitely expect more people to shift towards the Qt Quick, the QML for their applications. It's just so compelling and so easy to write applications uh, in it that look really great in, from the modern perspective, right? That I think this will, will continue to happen. Um, will it become the primary? I, I don't know. I think it's too early to tell yet. There's millions and millions of lines of code written in C++ using the old you know, Q widget stuff. Um, but we're seeing more and more people using Plasma in their apps. Scrooge, for instance, their next release, they actually have the dashboard that gives you an overview of all your finances, and that's all done with, with uh, uh, Plasma and Qt Quick. So, yeah. Yes. Uh, uh, it's another question. I just want to remind, uh, for those people who just raised Wait, or hands, when Aaron asks, who is using KD Desktop? Please remember to attend the BOF session in the evening. Thank so, you. It's going to rock, I promise. And I'll let you touch my tablet. <laughs> uh, sure. Yeah. Uh, my question is regarding to the previous questions. Uh, it's great to hear that uh, uh, KD has the license agreement with Nokia. But lately, we, we are seeing that there's a, a patent word in the mobile world, right? Yeah. And uh, I, don't, I don't know how, how you feel about this patent mess. And uh, is there anything the KDE community is doing for the patents? We have been against publicly against patents for well over a decade, uh, software patents. Let me clarify that. Against software patents for over a decade, publicly on our website. This is why. Um, we don't encourage the use of software patents. We do not engage in software patents ourselves. We are signatories with the Open Invention Network, which is, of course, a defensive patent pool. Uh, with regarding the recent mess with Apple, um, 
honestly, everyone who has an Apple product, remember when people from the free software community would come to you and go, but Apple's closed, and you went, but Apple's cool. Yeah, okay, thank you for supporting a company that's going nuclear with patents. Every time you purchase a device that is proprietary, every time you purchase a device from a company that is overtly, aggressively against your freedom, you are enabling these kind of messes to happen. We need to think more about this. We really do. Don't you have to think that? Yeah, I do. Yeah, which is from a company that is actually supporting open source and has much more of a freedom, I mean, agenda than Apple does. Yeah. Well, that maybe if you go back 20 years, but if you look at their involvement in free software, IBM, these talking about IBM in the last while. Um, I will say this, IBM is not trying to lock me into a, a welded at the seams app store environment and killing other people with patents. This is the issue. It is shades of gray, absolutely. There are no angels, but there certainly are devils. Uh, there was a question right there, and then maybe we'll break for lunch. Um, just now you mentioned that the, the, the Plasma Active apps are are not written in native codes. They are in uh, QML, uh, QML and stuff, and uh, you mentioned. But one of the issues that uh, most of the mobile users are concerned with is that the performance. Yeah. Yeah. So, I are there any techniques or measures taken to ensure that these codes that are not uh, programmed in native codes will run smoothly on uh, mo mobile devices with limited resources? Thank awesome you. question. Awesome question. So number one, um, some of the things I shaved off the presentation, which I'll now reintroduce. Uh, someone asked about Wayland earlier. We actually, uh, the window manager we use, Quinn, uh, runs as an, a, a Wayland uh, compositing manager now. It's alpha code, but it works. I've seen it. I played with it. We will probably be the first non-Wayland window manager to seriously support Wayland. We, on the device side, our goal is to be Wayland enabled in the next year, um, where we can actually ship production, usable, shippable, trustable code for Wayland. Um, we're also already running OpenGLES, so the window manager on here, um, although this tablet doesn't benefit from it much because it has OpenGL full, um, runs OpenGLES. But for OpenGLES only devices, like a lot of ARM devices, this already makes a huge difference. Okay, that's window management and, and what the window manager can provide. QML. Um, with QML, uh, in particular QML2, we have a scene, gra a proper scene graph, as in the term that you know it if you're a game developer, um, a proper scene graph for it. And this scene graph is OpenGL uh, uh, accelerated, in particular OpenGLES. Um, that's the target for it. And this allows us to aggressively um, optimize through hardware rendering uh, how applications are painted and rendered. And this works wonderfully on small devices. I mean, Nokia is using this now quite aggressively, and that's the whole reason for that, that approach. Um, you can write uh, OpenGLS uh, and OpenGL shaders directly into your QML code, so if you're looking to do something really impressive, you can incorporate it directly, and that gets rendered as part of the scene graph. Um, so you have a high degree of, of um, uh, flexibility and, and, and the ability to define what's happening in the scene graph. But even if you use just plain old QML with you know, flick lists and all of this, with QML2 and the OpenGL scene graph, it's 100% hardware uh, accelerated. And not in the sense of, oh, look, we can push you know, the pixels to the screen with an OpenGL buffer, but we are actually able to do transformations and schedule painting um, uh, with OpenGL very efficiently because Cute quick is declare, um, imperative, or sorry, declarative as opposed to imperative. So you declare your entire set um, of states essentially in your QML, um, and this gives the scene graph a very deep insight into how your UI is going to be presented at any given moment, and that in turn allows us to uh, aggressively uh, optimize the uh, OpenGL calls. I can talk to you more about that later if you wish. Good. Well, thank you very much for all of your uh, attention and your patience. I know I ate into your, some of your lunchtime. Thank you very much. Um, and again, if you have any questions, thoughts, criticisms, ideas, just come up to me over the next couple of days, and I'd be happy to listen. Thank you. Thank you, Aaron. Thank you.